Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Haunted Vermont Podcast. My name is Paul Doski, and joining us is a very awesome author, I would say, who's written a lot of books, who's also a paranormal investigator for 41 years, and uh, countless books, I would say, that it has been uh, based on, like, New England and stuff. So, without further ado, this is Tom D'Agostino. <laughs> How you doing? Good, good, Tom. Good. I hope you're having better weather than what Vermonters are dealing with right now with the unfortunately the flood weather. Yeah, I heard about that. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, Tom. So, real quick. Um, I mean, I've just we're go- kind of going through your bio on your website, TomDagostino.com. Uh, I guess in your own words. How would you explain yourself to somebody? Well, um, I'm a paranormal investigator, author. Uh, my wife and I, we've written like 18 books together, and we've uh, been all over the place. We've seen a million things, seen a lot of nothing. And uh, we run a business called Dining with the Dead 1031, where we go into the most haunted places around New England. And uh, we have like, you know, dinner and, and we get to investigate the most haunted areas, but you're the investigator. So we break into groups and everybody investigates and using all the equipment, we show them how to use it. And uh, basically, uh, we um, have still do private investigations and all that kind of stuff and live to adventure. Fair enough. That's uh, mm-hmm. easy put. So you and your wife are mainly going around doing all the spooky stuff and everything. So what kind of got you into the field of the paranormal to begin with? Uh, first, I, I actually grew up in a haunted house. I was um, about 20, 22 years old when uh, my friend, I was in college, and uh, my friend goes, hey, I just bought a house really cheap, and I need someone to live in it for the winter because I'm going to turn it over, you know, flip it. So I said, yeah, I'll do that. And so I moved in. I lasted six days. There was so much stuff going on in this house that uh, I couldn't get any sleep. I couldn't study. And then so I started studying basically all kinds of sciences, physical sciences, social sciences, esoterical sciences, just to see why and what, you know. So it wasn't something like I just went out and, you know, saw a movie or something, say, I'm going to do this. I, I studied for a few years to see if there were any kind of logical you know, explanations. Fair enough. Um, so I guess while you've been living there, what was some of the stuff that was going on? Like with stuff like levitating, lifting, were you shifting around or just like random, uh, you know, footstep, shadow figures? Uh, one, well, one night I heard this crackling noise and it sounded what I thought was a branch uh, banging up against the window of, in the parlor. And when I walked in the parlor, there was just, just this glowing figure standing there in the darkness in the other cor- in the you know, far corner. But it was like, almost sounded like it was crackling. And it started moving toward me. And then um, I turned on the light and it was, in, it was gone. Then uh, another night, me, my friend, and my friend who's going out with my sister at the time and our cousin, we were sitting at the top of the stairs of this house. It was three floors and we were on the third floor at this point. And um, somebody just, it sounded like they tore the door open at the bottom of the stairs and came bolting up the stairs after us. And all we felt was a wind go by us. Wow. And then, yeah, one of the, one of the biggest things that's happened, never happened since. I mean, it's been a long time and it's never happened since was when, uh, we were, again, in that same spot, and I was coming out of the kitchen. We were all just joking, and all of a sudden, it was like somebody put us on pause. We all just froze, and the window at the top of the stairs came out of the frame and rolled across the floor, and then, boom, like we were snapped out of that spell. My my sister and my, my cousin, they, they never even hit a stair going down. They were gone. <laughs> huh. So it was huh. that kind of stuff that was happening. Uh, so that would you say that's almost uh, well? I don't know. It might be the right term, but would that would you consider that to almost be like a you know a time warp or something? I don't know. I, I it would be more if it was anything. Um, it could be part residual, part maybe intelligent. Uh, who knows? You know, uh, maybe several because it, I never really got a chance to find out because we were out of there in six days, and then he sold the house and never moved in. <laughs> 
So, you know, and if, uh, I would talk to people later on, a few of the, uh, the house went to a lot of owners and they said that, yeah, things were going on in there and it was, you know, it was pretty haunted. And uh, I have a picture I took of it while I was outside. And when I got it developed, you could see someone looking out the window at me in a white, long white dress. Huh. Which is kind of odd because nobody should have been in the house. <laughs> yeah, because it should have just been, as far as I know, you and maybe a couple other people. Oh. Yeah, if they were going to be there, I should have been. <laughs> yeah, it was exactly. otherwise empty, I should say. <laughs> well, that's interesting. <laughs> um, I guess real quick, you know, since you've been investigating, um, you know, what maybe one of the most, I would say scariest thing, but what is the most cool, what to say, what's the most interesting experience that you've ever really ha seen or heard? Well, um, some of the most interesting actually happened here in our house, which is kind of cool. And uh, we've had all our friends from the TV shows, they, they're friends with us, they, they've come over and investigated with us, and uh, they're still stunned to this day at some of the things that happened. Uh, like <clears throat> we've seen like full bodied apparitions just walk by while you're talking, uh, just walk right through like, like, okay. And, uh, and so it is quite, a, this house is quite amazing. Um, the wealthiest man in Putnam once owned it. Uh, but in other places, the Ramtail factory in Foster, Rhode Island, where we've actually seen what they call not only the lantern light, but the guy who makes his rounds in the ruins of the old factory. He, we actually had him. We actually saw him when I going when I traced back. I could see where the buildings were. It looked like he was going in and out of the waste shed, the old factory, and everything. Like actually doing rounds by candlelight. And one of the wildest things that ever happened to us was um, we were doing an old factory in Greenville, Rhode Island. We we're on the third floor where nobody nobody goes up there. And uh, oh. at the, and my friend owned the the um, storage place below on the first floor. So while we were up there, I said, can you show us a sign? And there's no electricity up there. So we had our spotlights and we were in the middle of the floor. And all of a sudden, it was like somebody was either slamming chains. The machines were starting up. They were all around us. Bang, bang, all around us. And we left. We went downstairs after the, about a minute or so of this and it stopped. And we went and we left the recorder. When we went to retrieve it, my friend went to the other end of the room. Again, no electricity. It's dark. All of a sudden, you hear this thing go flying across the room and hit the floor. It's something threw something at him. But we, it was 11 at night. There was nobody in that building. So it was pretty interesting. <laughs> Did you ever find whatever was thrown? Uh, it was a board. You could tell it was a giant two by four. <laughs> By the way, it hit, and when we looked over there, yeah, and he was afraid to move because he was afraid if he gave away his position, he might next time he might get hit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd want to move either with that. Um, you know, just for, you know, since we're on the topic of throwing stuff real quick, um, you know, they say like uh, cryptid, uh, especially like uh, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, you know, mm. they say like they throw stuff at people to either scare them or something so i mean in this case you it sounds like you guys are dealing with a with a poltergeist versus something physical yeah well when, when that happened uh the next day i told my friend and he said really he goes that's interesting because that used to be a like my, my actually my brother used to work there when he was in high school <laughs> and when it was actually open the upstairs the third floor and my friend was hired to replace the windows up there because they were falling out and it was a blight, you know, and the town's like, uh, fix this. So the guy gave him, you know, said, I'll pay you 1500 to replace the windows. Like, this is great. I just go upstairs after I close my store. And he lasted one set of windows because while he was in up there and he had the big spotlight, you know, the commercial spotlight, all of a sudden it sounded like somebody was slamming chains around him, the same exact sound. And the wow. people at the antique store, they were given free reign to store stuff up there, and they bolted the door up instead and boarded it because they heard they actually ate were, uh, you know, heard the whatever is up there, the noisy ghosts. Sounds like the mill was back in business. That's all. Back in business. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I guess, however you want to look at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, ghost carpeting, whatever. <laughs> there you go. Uh, that's a new one. Yeah, I'll have to remember that one. That's funny. Um, 
Yeah, so Tom, like, I guess, uh, you know, let's go into your, like, adventure of Haunted Vermont, as uh, you put with your mm -hmm. book that I finally got uh, got a hold of, finally. Um, so you and your wife, obviously, have been traveling, as you said. So what kind of, you know, what, I guess, gravitated you to, like, the Green Mountain State? Well, we wanted, when we first started, we started with Rhode Island, which is where we're from. And uh, it was like, wow, no one ever did a book on New Hampshire or Vermont. I, you know, they're like, where where are they all? I'm sure the places are lots of haunts and cool places. So we're like, well, let's do these. So we started doing one on each state. We never did Maine, though, because <clears throat> a lady, TM Gray, did an awesome book on Maine. And she just, she lives there her whole life and covered it. And we're like, fine, leave that one alone. But on, in Vermont, it was like, wow, these people would love to probably go visit places. Let's go find and dig. So, you know, we started digging, and I'm part of the New England Historical Society and other societies, and we started visiting. We're like, wow, this is, like, very interesting. Each state has their own kind of interesting haunts, <laughs> collection of haunts in many cases, and, and Vermont was no different. So we were like, we, we loved it. We were going all over the place, and actually, um, one side of my family is from Swanton, Vermont. Oh, cool. That's cool. Yeah, yeah the, I don't the, even the know. French side. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how bad Swanton just got hit with the flood, but I mean, hopefully everybody's okay. So um, I just know there's a couple places for the flood that is underwater uh, right now, so it's pretty bad. Wow. From, yeah, they're actually calling it worse than Irene, which kind of sucks. So oh wow, yeah, that yeah. is bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. but Swanton, yeah, that's um, that's a nice little town. I've only been through it maybe once in my life. <laughs> maybe one day I can always go back. Yeah, so, that's up there. It's right on the border. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's quite a drive, but it's still worth it, though. Um, so I guess, you, so your wife, who's going with you, she helped you for, uh, do photograph for each place, correct? Yeah, she's a professional photographer, yeah. <clears throat> All right, well, from what I've seen from some of the pictures that are in here, because uh, it looks like every now and then there's not a picture, which is fine. But, I mean, I, I completely get it. But either way, some of these are really, like, sketchy looking and stuff like that. So I guess um, I wanted to dive in a little bit of um, some places that maybe have some information that I'm kind of uh, familiar with, and maybe we can get you to add a little bit more to help bring it into more of a, a spectrum of like why is there like a weird tale here like one example that you may have heard of tom is uh lake bombazine oh yeah uh, you know that uh, uh i mean i let me see real quick uh Oh, yeah, you do actually mention it, too, which is that famous uh, story about how there's, like, a phantom rowboat. Yeah, where the they, Irish immigrants that disappeared, never to be seen again. Yeah, and, you know, that's all we can really get. So did you ever uh, find out, like, was it just, were they trying to go get some some drinks for their party or something. And then when they went back, that's where they seem to have vanished into the, um, I guess the, the fog or mist. Yeah. They probably went like to that bar. There were the taverns and bars and stuff. And on the way back, uh, it's, I mean, it's not like every day, but it's not uncommon that people, even uh, down in Rhode Island, we are, you know, you're the, the ocean state go out on a boat all wasted. And the next thing you know, where are they? You know, so it's happened before. Unfortunately, it's happened to some people we know. But you know, uh, it, it, it. I mean, how many people used to roll across there to that tavern? Probably every night. <laughs> and yeah, that that's true. It happened, and well, now they uh, appear all the time. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's just fascinating because um, you don't really hear too many um, stories about vanishing on water until like lately i guess like when you really start to look at it there's a lot more disappearances on the water than there is anywhere else it seems like so i don't know if you get that same idea yeah well what happens is people like that sometimes um if you know there's three or four people and one falls in and the other goes to save them and then or something happens you know the boat half flips and they're all wasted and they can't swim uh, we've had instances where 
in my old town where a few people drowned in three feet of water because they get tangled in the weeds. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, those weeds are quite dangerous, especially when you wrap around. You, know, you, you can fall in. You can be a great swimmer. But if you start getting tangled in some of those things, and oh. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, I find it really interesting how uh, thick and strong the weeds can actually be to just, you know, pull you down, I guess, per se. Um, yeah, well, like, if you move and they start wrapping around you, then you're rolling downward. <laughs> and they're wrapping you deeper in. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, weird all on its own. and <laughs> But, yes, I mean, that could be a good way to, you know, debunk the theories of why, you know, ghostly things happen like that or why they disappeared. Or maybe, like you said, somebody fell in. Uh, they tried to, you know, they tried to rescue them. And, you know, next thing you know, instead of one guy, you got two guys that are going down so, or three, depending on <laughs> what it is. Maybe they got into an argument and started pushing each other over. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. Uh, speaking of, like, which, which um, I'm pretty sure you, I mean, you must have mentioned it, but if not, I mean, I'm pretty sure you're familiar anyway, but it's, uh, you know, like Champlain, you know, uh, you know, we hear about, like, the the phantom ships there and we also got the well-known lake uh lake monster champ stuff like that um you know are you kind of familiar with anything uh, uh regarding those well you know i did i think i did put champ in there in, in some of the cases uh because actually my wife's daughter lived right on lake champlain in burlington vermont for several years so definitely we had a lot really cool uh you know um couple of stories there for Lake Champlain, which is interesting. Indeed. Um, yeah, Champ, you know, they, they, they're they not sure what he is, what it is, what he or she, Champ. And um, the the ghost ship, I'm not too familiar with that one, but it definitely had read about it. Yeah, it was something it, it involved uh, the steamboat um, Phoenix. Oh, I okay. Say, where supposedly... The captain uh, wouldn't let this specific woman on board, and so the legend basically said that this woman cursed the the boat, and basically uh, a fire struck out on the uh, steamboat Phoenix, and basically met its doom in Lake Champlain. <laughs> well, hey, you gotta, I mean, well, you gotta let people on board, right? They all curse you all the time. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you how many. Stories we have like that. The ship went down because the lady, the lady on the dock cursed it. Interesting. I think I've read about that. I definitely read about that, yeah. Yeah, I know um, author uh, Sia Lewis mentioned something on it. And so um, that's the okay, really yeah. about, yeah, that's about the only, uh, only author that I know of that may have mentioned something about a ghost ship. So I thought that was interesting nonetheless, because, you know, I all, you always hear about like the one we were just talking about, you know, the Phantom Robo from Lake Bomazine. Yeah, yeah. So, so I don't think you would ever expect uh, like an actual ship to be lingering around Wake Champlain, but then again, look how many shipwrecks are in Wake Champlain, over 300 or so. Oh, yeah, huh? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, I guess, uh, Tom, you know, instead of me just, like, uh, maybe mentioning specific locations, but, like, is there any locations in Vermont that you would like to, uh, you know, tell your story of, of what really fascinated you around Vermont, I guess. Like, um, just real quick, I'll just throw one more, which is actually the cover of your book, uh, The Bowman Mis Mansion from oh, yeah. uh, Cunningville. Um, you know, like, uh, obviously we know that one pretty well um, with, you know, Mr. Bowman will, final will was basically, you know, he wanted his uh, servants, I'll say, uh, caretakers to basically keep setting dinner plates out so even after death him and his family could come and eat and stuff like that yeah very interesting and um actually the the mausoleum is awesome if you ever been to it mm -hmm. yeah I'm inside it looks like it just keeps going and going with the use of mirrors and things yeah, but it looks it, it's really awesome and the story's awesome too I mean John Porter Bowman 
uh, then uh, of course Laurel Hill it, it's closed but it's open if if you're lucky enough to get somebody near there to let you in but uh the, the, I like the story of the the little girl who stuck her tongue out of the picture and it flew out at her <laughs> yes yeah. yeah and uh different you know different things about that with the marble mortar they call it you know which is really cool how he had that done and so it's always like when we go by if we're in that area we always have to go by and stop that's and basically visit. what i gotta do i gotta always stop and you know pay my respect to mr bowman mm. and his family i feel like one um of, yeah. yeah one of the best ones oh it's, it's our favorites is um in reading vermont the uh spite cemetery there's a yeah, it's a really cool one. It's um, it's actually a bed and breakfast. It's called Bailey's Bed and Breakfast in Reading, Vermont. But there's a road. It it is literally a road, even though it's like a dirt, looks like it's more like a dirt driveway. But it's it's a it's a actual road road, and right on the other side of that road slash dirt driveway is the big cemetery, and Levi Bailey owned the mill, and uh, you know his home, and uh, David Hapgood owned the land across the street. Now he thought, wow, if I could have that land, um, I could expand, right? And expand my mill, expand my operations. This would be great. But Hapgood hated him and wouldn't give him a, an, even like an inch of land. And so, you know, Bailey said, hey, look, you're old, man. You're going to die before I do, and I'm going to get that land. So, uh, yes, Mr. Hapgood does pass away before Levi Bailey does, but he goes to get the land. And they said, oh, no, he donated it as a cemetery. And to make it even more spiteful, they buried him right there in front of his face. He was the first one buried in the cemetery, right in front of Levi Bailey's house. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. So when Bailey finally died, he had a plot in the cemetery. So we did get a piece of the land. <laughs> in a but, way, uh, yeah. yeah. Yep. Oh, there it is. Yep. Now, yeah. I'll yeah. Put, it's really, it that's a cool one. And, of course, the Eddy family, which is just insanely, you know, defies logic. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, the Eddie brothers. Yeah, uh, William and Horatio Eddie. Yes. Yeah, and Mary was another one, and um, and uh, Francis Lightfoot. He was another one. Um, when he was in the Civil War, he what did he got? Um, I think it was scarlet fever, or tuberculosis. Yeah, it was consumption. And uh, while he was sick in home, he wrote down the day, the date, and the time he was going to die. And sometime in between, a wagon pulled up and brought a coffin. With a plate on it, and they go, they they grabbed candles because uh, they didn't have, you know, they, they didn't have big lighting and everything. And I don't even think kerosene had made it out to Vermont yet, because that was 1853 when kerosene was first introduced to the world. But uh, they went and grabbed the candle. So when they got back, the coffin was gone, the two soldiers were gone, and the wagon was gone. When he died, they uh, sent to Rutland to have a coffin made for him. And right while they're standing there, the same wagon pulls up with the same two soldiers who get out and put the same coffin in the hallway. Huh. And wow. he died the exact day he said he was going to die. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, his, his sister Miranda, after she died, they all witnessed her lift her hand up and close her own eyes. Wow. So yeah, so I mean, just the other the Eddies, William Eddy, you know, having all these different spirits coming out of that little dinky closet of all different sizes, shapes, and you know, men, women, and everything. And this guy was over six feet tall, and they couldn't even ever figure that out. So yeah, it's pretty wild. It's it's the High Life Ski Club now. Yes, it is. They let us in. They said, "Hey, you want to stay a night? Come on, stay a night. You can sleep and sleep upstairs where they used to hold the seances." <laughs> <laughs> We've yet to go back and stay a night, but we'd love to. Yeah, they're actually allowing people again to to actually come over and spend a weekend now for like sixty bucks a month or sixty bucks a night, not a month. Sorry, Jesus, that's a super bargain. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> a Motel Six is a hundred. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, uh, not to cut you off. Sorry, Tom, but um, I was gonna say real quick is uh, I actually had the pleasure to go into the uh, the High Life Ski Lodge twice, um, not to spend the night, but just to you know hang out with whoever was there that invited us in, and um, you know um, what a wonderful, lovely place inside, as I may say. It so. is. It's cool. They got the little kitchen. You can bring your own food and, you know, your own little quarters to make your own stuff. And it was really, it's awesome. Yeah, I love their uh, their their uh, broken bone meter that they have. 
So well, yeah. <laughs> Be, uh, for, just in case more people just don't know, so Hiwa Ski Wad, they do like a uh, special thing like skiing, biking, they're like open all year round, so they don't just do one particular thing. So, um, they also are actually based out of New Jersey, I just forget where New Jersey, but oh, wow. I know that's where they're based out of, yeah. Um, but yeah, we can't forget about the Eddie Brothers, um, <laughs> um, I guess. You know, so I've yeah. You don't have anything for Swanton, but is there anything that goes on in Swanton that you, that would not unfortunately able to make it into the the book? Um, not that I really know. Of. I know in the area there uh, is that nice man, uh, that nice tall tale of uh, you know freezing Vermonters and stuff. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I actually met, I guess it was a cousin, uh, she was going out with a friend of ours from Berkshire Paranormal, and she, it ended up being one of my cousins, second cousins, actually. Uh, she was a Jeru from Swanton, and it was pretty interesting, you know. She just told a few tales of the area, but um, nothing I hadn't already heard, but it was cool. Huh? Sounds very cool. Yeah, the uh, the frozen people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always a good story. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta love that where they basically, you know, freed their their older people for the winter, and then they saw them out once spring hits. So yeah, it was it was supposedly a tall tale, you know, uh, by the fire. Oh yeah, who, who would outdo who? <laughs> who would outdo who? Yep, 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 yeah. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, but that one always. I don't know. Every time winter comes, you know, you just gotta share that one. It's like, oh, who wants to try getting frozen and get sawed out in spring? So, yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I guess money you'd save. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you hear about uh, what are they frogs? I think that can do it, where they can freeze and then they can come back to life when the spring. Um, you know, so it's it's interesting to hear stuff like that. Like, I mean, you know, that's the favorite time of the year for everybody. You know, that's when all the bugs mm. bug go back to hell, as they call it. Yeah, so. yeah they actually do the uh, frog ponds and everything. They actually just, if, and fish, yeah. they'll go and they'll just, boom, like hibernate just about, you know, because uh, under the water line until spring and then boom. Yeah, it's it's it fascinates me when you really start to look at some of the cool stuff that uh, reptilians and bugs can actually do. So, um, you, you know, it's like, uh, probably you had to have done it when you were younger, Tom, like, you know, you caught a fly and you're like, oh, I'm going to get you fly. And then you stuff them like in some, into something. And then you put them in your freezer. Right. And then you think it's dead and then you take it out maybe. And then because of the warmth to bring it back to life, maybe. Yeah. You know? I, I, ne I never did it, but I'm sure I know some people who have, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that yeah they hibernate, basically hibernate. Bees, the honeybees, they have fur on them because of that, so they can uh, live through the winter. Yeah, bumblebees, you gotta yep. you gotta appreciate the bumblebees. Hey, they give us our food. <laughs> uh, without the bees, we would be in trouble <laughs> for a lot of things. There, there's a, a I know um, like you were saying about the vampires, uh, they. You know, the, some of the earliest cases happened in Vermont. And one of the things that we found out is uh, in Rhode Island is where, you know, it was mostly shed, you know, oh, my God, vampires, Rhode Island, blah, 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 was the vampire capital of New England, while New England's the vampire capital of the world. Well, the first cases that took place in um, Connecticut, the ones in Connecticut and the ones in Vermont, all those people had moved from Rhode Island. When um yeah, when uh, Vermont had opened up as like a statehood, the, nobody was there. So they're like, hey, you want some land? We need to like populate this place. <laughs> That's true. So a lot of um, them said, hey, yeah, come on. Yeah. Um. So I I I just want to put it on the record just in case. Um. So uh, Tom mentioned like I mentioned the whole vampires in Vermont thing. I want to make sure that. If it's not on the recording already, that it is now. But yes, I did mention something to Tom about the the vampires in uh, Vermont. So um, just mm -hmm. in case somebody got confused of, <laughs> of like, wait, when did I say that? So yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Um, 
I didn't realize that would one of the that we were one of the first like cases per se. But uh, is that also coincide with uh, what was his name, the Corwin case? Was oh yeah, the Corwin case. Yeah, um, that one. They're not sure if it ever really existed, even though some of the names are true. Like uh, they because they could never find any of the um, names in Cushing Cemetery, and they could never find the. Uh, you know, the, the, what are the cauldron with the ashes and the bull's blood and all that. And so, um, they've taken that, you know, that they've dug up that, that green many times, obviously, you know, you got to put sidewalks in, you got to do this, got to do that, put lighting in and nothing, nothing was ever found of that. Uh, but the other Rachel Har uh, yeah, the Burton case, the, uh, Spalding case, the, <clears throat> that all happened. Hmm. Yeah, I know. Harris, oh, yeah. Yeah, I know there was, um, I don't have it in front of me right now, but uh, there was like a newspaper article about the one in Woodstock, too. It was like something about vampirism in Woodstock. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that would be, um, the that was Woodstock's first vampire. It was uh, Frederick Ransom um, who wrote a memoir of, of his brother dying of it it was that was the ransom case i actually have a copy of the paperwork from the his memoir talking about it oh wow huh uh yeah i just want to just quickly see if i can find that uh, <laughs> that article real quick because otherwise i feel like that's gonna bug me but i want to say it was like october 9th um 18 1890, October 9th, 1890. It was in the, the newspaper. And yeah, it was entitled Vampirism in Woodstock. For anybody that's curious, I guess, that would like to look it up. <laughs> um, very fascinating stuff. But um, so I guess, Tom, like, you know, from there, you kind of go through Rutland. There used to be an old inn there that... Um, I only just found out from your book. It was called like the Inn at Rutland. Um, mm -hmm. You you were mentioning something about in the book about uh, it had two friendly ghosts. Unfortunately, this Inn that you speak of is like no longer existent. It turned into something else. I just can't find what it turned into. I drove by it, but I still can't even find like anything more about um, you know. I guess why it disappeared or anything, but it doesn't sound like it, it would, uh, it didn't last long, unfortunately. That's too bad. Book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually a, a little girl on the third floor, right? Uh, the, well, uh, there was, who knows if it's still like the building is still standing. That doesn't mean the ghost left, you know, exactly. I, I don't, I, I don't think they can get evicted. Like, <laughs> not like, a, you know, the humans can, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, oh yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, Tom. Well, maybe. Would I mean? So, would you say the only way a ghost could probably get quote evicted would be if the the building were to be destroyed? That I'm. That's a good question because I'm. I have few cases where even though the building was destroyed and something new was put in its place the energy still stayed in that spot. We were doing an investigation once of a house. Uh, it was a new house. It was a new plat. The house was six years old, and they see something appear in the garage. Oh, wow. And, uh, they even showed me a picture of them going, oh, Jesus, what the heck is that? And they're like, we don't know, but this is what. So I'm saying, looking around, I'm going, this is a whole new plat except for that house right there. And like about five houses down, you can see this nice, tall, old, old farmhouse. And so oh, wow. there's the ladies out there, and she's just, you know, doing her little gardening and stuff. So I said, let's go over and talk to her. We go over and talk to her. We're saying, we're, you know, telling her that the flat is new. And she goes, oh, yeah. She goes, um, I own this whole section here. And I did sell my section, but I forgot she said the name of her neighbor. But he sold, um, his family sold the section after he died, the whole farm. They didn't want anything to do. In fact, you see that house right there? And I said, yeah. He goes, he was standing right there the day he died working in the field. Wow. And they built a house right on the spot he died. So there you go. <laughs> wow. 
that seems to happen a lot, especially like with, uh, you know, old like burial ground from Indians or something where, you know, they, they park a house or build a house right on a burial mound. They don't even realize it. And the next thing you know, yep. they're wondering why they're having paranormal experiences and they can't figure it out. And then it's like, oh, well, you know, back in the day, this used to be in an Indian burial. Oh, yeah. no wonder why. <laughs> Yeah, 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 because the Indians didn't exactly make headstones with nice carvings and everything. They, <laughs> it wasn't, a, um, you know, something of their culture. So I'm sure they, uh, many, many, many have been obliterated. Yeah, unfortunately, I would say. But um, so, Tom, to go back to the inn at Rutland, you were mentioning uh, there was a little girl on the, uh, on the third floor? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, I guess, uh, the little girl, they, they think it might have been the Burdett family who, you know, they originally lived in the house. They were the big people who lived in the house, the, the main characters. But uh, anybody, it could be. I love that when they, people say, well, they built the house, so it's got to be them. You know, it could have been somebody, a cousin who used to stay there every Wednesday of the, you know, third Wednesday of the month or something. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the presence is that they, you know, they just uh, they they're happy. They just love being there, and it's, it still must be their home, or it must be somewhere that in life that energy found a nice peace in the area to you know remain. That's true. I mean, I, they... yeah. When I studied meteorology, I came up with a hypothesis, and that was when we when you study meteorology and you you're predicting weather, you're not predicting weather for a room. You're predicting uh, weather patterns and pressure zones for giant regions. And these pressure zones cause energy to be manipulated and manifested in different ways, like the flooding, you know, the, oh, rain, yeah, yeah. the hurricanes, the tornadoes. Well, these pressure zones could be as small as a table or a, or a house or a room or, you know, uh, four houses large and um, causing energy to manifest or be manipulated in a way that they're uh, spirits us energy being trapped there and that's your energy your your kind of aura or energy form and that's where it stays so that's why they would say like um you it's know just I, a hypothesis <laughs> <laughs> well that's that that you know it makes a good point of saying like um you know that's where the um I guess it depends on who you want to talk to that would say it, but like in this case, you know, the stain, like that's what, like they call it the stain or yeah. or the mark of like, that's why you may get like a residual haunting, you know, mm -hmm. because it's always repeating It's because of the mark. So like, um, you know, another pretty famous place that everybody knows in Vermont is where the only battle in Vermont took place which is a uh, Hubbardton battlefield. And, you know, you got to think for something like that, that went on supposedly somewhere around three to five hours. Uh, so, you know, like every time somebody got shot, blood is pouring on the field per se, uh, you got the cannon. Uh, ca yeah. The cannons and stuff like that. And people screaming and everything else. It's like that right there is already leaving a imprint of, of yeah, energy, yeah. The event, yeah, of, of energy, yeah. And then, uh, you know, and then later on, as uh, investigators come, you know, they get that residual haunting, um, which is for those listening, just in case, uh, residual haunting is basically like a, like it's, it's like if you put in your record, like your favorite record, and you listen to it all the way through, and then you repeat it. It's basically that's what a residual haunting is. So, like in this case, the Hubbardton Battlefield, the Hubbardton Battlefield will just keep repeating itself over and over and over. Yeah, when the conditions prevail, probably that caused it. Yeah, exactly. And um, you know, this past weekend, uh, as I record this, this is July eleventh. Uh, this past weekend, so July uh, 8th and 9th, they actually just did uh, the reenactment for Hubbardton Battlefield. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's cool. <clears throat> yeah, so I almost feel like maybe that might have stirred things up a little bit again. 
that would do it. That would that would definitely do it. You can you're recreating the moment that happens, and you know you get all that going on, and it's the same energy feel. And so, why wouldn't it be attracted back over for a bit? Right. That's true. That's true. Uh, that's like another thing that people kind of uh, you can you can more probably pitch in more than I can, Tom. But you know, it's like a uh, perfect example, right? You said you moved into a house uh that your friend wanted to flip and mm -hmm. and everything else so i guess real quick to kind of go back to that to kind of make it into this point that i'm trying to get is um so as you were living there even though it was like six days was there any work going on the house to maybe amp up the the activity you know what i'm getting at like like you know as people start to restore do uh restoration to their home or whatever no actually what was happening is the other people were just gone moved out and then uh, me and my friend moved in um he wanted to he wanted to move in too he was going out with my sister at the time They're like oh i want to live there and i'm like well i guess it's big enough it's three floors <laughs> it's big enough to have some extra person in there so it, i guess the new strange people energy us um in the lack of the other energy, which was uh, the you know this guy and his his wife and the daughters and everything, uh, probably is what really tilted the scales in that case. Hmm. Maybe they didn't like us. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> you know, huh? <laughs> but would you agree with that though? Like, depending on. You know, depending on the person or the place, if it needs to get flipped or worked on, do you feel though as like uh, restoration to a, a place, whether it be to restore it or maybe take down a wall because they don't want that wall anymore? Do you feel like that would help or that would trigger the awakening of whatever dwinger in there? Well, this is a great. That's a that's a great. Um, I guess lead into this because when we bought this house, they were the guy, William Grinnold was, um, bought it really cheap. Uh, the guy who had it before us died in the house, right in the bedroom, right, right where we sleep. He died of a heart attack at like 55. And, um, he started rebuilding it because the house was a wreck and he had people quitting left and right because they'd be working upstairs. Now we got the wide, wide staircase that, you know, you look down to see like the Beverly Hillbillies one, you know, it goes around the corner just a little. You can see the whole staircase. They'd hear some, the guy would have like the windowsills of huge shelves because they don't those six foot windows. It's a, it's a Victorian. And they'd maybe hear someone coming. The guy would be working. He'd hear someone coming up the stairs and he'd look over to say, you know, say hi to somebody and there's nobody there, but he could hear it. And then his tools would be gone. There's, you see, the guy said he had about five or six people quit on the spot because of that stuff. And even when we moved in, I mean, it was all ready to go. You know, we had a brand new kitchen, brand new appliances. I didn't like the colors, so we started doing more work on it. And it just and everything that just kept going and going and going for year, three, four years. It was uh, very, very extremely active. They're still here. We still hear them. The things still happen. You still hear the children laughing and running upstairs in the back hallways. You still hear the voices of desperate people at night. You still, you know, hear things going on. You still hear the doors open. And we're the only two people in the house. And it's, you know, we lock the doors in the winter and in the summer just to keep the cool air in or the hot air, you know. And, and, uh, it, so yeah, it was always restoration and rebuilding of this place. And it became a hotbed. <laughs> wow yeah uh so perfect you know i feel like this would be a good way to segue into what i'm about to say again so um so obviously some of the old uh well maybe i want to say old but you know they, like some of the old things that people would say would be like um you know i watched this person walk through a wall you know like that can't happen mm. so if we actually uh you know, look at it in a way of people would, I guess, would like uh, um, house blueprints, right? Mm. So we can actually take a look at what the layout of the house was originally compared to like what they, like somebody like us or you maybe even where we either, uh, you know, e 
uh, knock down a wall, or maybe we put up a wall in this case. But yeah, Jordan, that that space used to not have a wall there. So in this case, you know that spirit that yeah. maybe going through this wall is just familiar with the uh, the way out of the time of her them being there. Exactly. Actually, this wall right behind me. Right directly behind me was the doorway to the kitchen. This is a di this was a dining room, and the doorway and entryway was directly behind me in the kitchen. Now, if you go through that wall, you're going to end up in the sink, <laughs> the kitchen sink and dishwasher. That's well, I guess, the side of the wall. <laughs> well, well, Tom, is it safe to say then? Have you seen any apparition go through that wall? No, no, I actually have not. Huh. We've just seen them. Yeah, they don't go. They haven't been going through walls. They just walk around. <laughs> we, the funniest one is um, we almost began to joke about it. We'd be sitting watching TV, but we'd be on the other side of the parlor, and we would see someone walking by the front door to the stairs. Hmm. And they're like they're going upstairs, and it was pretty in interesting because I'm like that's all we see is. And our dog chased it one night. <laughs> <laughs> He just went, Roar! we look over, there's this black figure just walking toward the stairs. And, uh, yeah, and, and incidentally, uh, the guy who owned this house that we bought it from, William Grinnold, his brother was Bob Grinnold, who owned the White House in Wilmington. So, let's just say that the house that you're currently in is quite, uh, quite old. <laughs> Yeah, it was built, the wealthiest man, in, in fact, uh, we have a window, a stained glass window that Louis Tiffany made, because he comes from this area, huh. and uh, yeah, and he was, I guess he went around doing for all the wealthy people, he went around making stained glass windows for them when they wanted to, because there's several of them in the neighborhood. Oh, wow, so you <laughs> technically have like an original um, stained glass then still. Yeah, from yeah, with the you know his signature dragonfly butterfly stuff motifs. Yeah, it, it's, I'm sure it's not worth as much as his lamps because he can't pull it out and you know bring it around. <laughs> it's definitely not healthy for the house in a storm either. But yeah, but it, it's definitely um you can you know it was a Tiffany just like there's several of them around here. This was this, he came from around this here um, when it was this Putnam was in 1855. It was became a, its own town. And before that, it was part of Killingly, Pomfret, and, um, you know, Woodstock. Stock. Hmm. Fun, fun, fun. Oh, man. <laughs> so, I guess, is it safe to say then, uh, of the spirits that you're dealing with currently in your house, would you say that they're, they're intelligent? Like, they actually know that you're there, and they know, like, what you've done to your, po your you know, your place? A few of them are, yeah. A few of them are intelligent. What we've done actually is we the place looks like you're back in 1920. It's got the original chandeliers, the furniture is from the 17 and 1800s. Um, any speakers and everything like that are all hidden behind things. We have actually an old uh, 1929 Vic radio, uh, and inside of that is the Alexa. <laughs> oh wow. You turn it on and it goes on, but we don't, we get crappy reception. I mean, you, we get even, we have a radio station down the street. We can't even get it. <laughs> we get crappy reception here. So um, the radio does work, but we use it just to put the, uh, you know, the, the Alexa in cool. and that kind of thing. So when you walk in, you don't see any modern conveniences. We have candlestick, telephones. <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow yeah but, so they're happy with forever. what we do yeah they're happy i guess they feel like they're at home well that's good <laughs> i mean because yeah, they are they don't... <laughs> yeah well you know i mean as long as they don't seem like they're angry at you for no they just go on, they just go on living <laughs> our neighbors have seen them our, our neighbors have come over hey i saw adele on the balcony last night you know the guy who died like uh 20 years ago almost and uh, or they're like they, one guy came to the door. I fixed his truck. Uh, he he was on a walker. He just had back surgery, and he was like 70, 72 years old, and he couldn't do it. And I'm like, well, I'll fix it. I'll I'll change the transmission line. And he goes, what do I owe? He said, nothing. You're my friend and neighbor. I got to charge you for you know a half hour's work of just hanging out and doing something I love to do anyway. 
So he, wanted, he brought me a case of beer, and I was out running. He wanted to give me the case of beer. So he went across, he cuts across the, the a small yard on the side here, which used to be our carriage house, go to the back door, knocks on the back door, and the neighbors said they just saw him running across the yard with the walker over his head. <laughs> and they, later they, um, they said, you know Tom's house is haunted? Oh, yeah, he said he saw a man, a short man, a little heavy set with a boy in the kitchen. And you can see the whole kitchen. It's a big kitchen. And when you look in the door, you see the whole kitchen. Huh. And they, they looked like they were glowing. It was 1.30 in the afternoon. Wow. And then he just ran. And I, the way he described it, it's Phineas G. Wright, who was the wealthiest man in Putnam, who came from um, Fitzwilliam, New Hampshire, actually. And when he, when he, before he died, he had a stone made. And on his stone, he had a likeness of him made. And at the bottom of it, it said, going, but no, not where. And then he had the grave brick lined and filled with rum. So when the people who buried him were finished, they could drink the rum. And that stone is famous. If you look it up in those books of famous epitaphs and stuff, you'll see it. <laughs> That's who we saw. Huh. Perfect. Because he yeah, owned I'll the have to, huh, yeah, <laughs> I'll have to look it up so I can uh, see it for myself mm -hmm. now. Um, yeah. I guess, Tom, to kind of, you know, wrap things up for this chat a little bit, because I don't want to take too much more of your time. But, you know, so almost every every year, you know, people are starting to, you know, want to get the thrill of ghost hunting. And one thing that I love about your book uh, for Haunted Vermont is in the back, you did like a bonus chapter about uh, your ghost hunting equipment. Yeah. Um, so I guess what I just wanted to, I guess, uh, you know, uh, get to is like, so if I wanted to start a paranormal group again, what would you suggest for uh, new people of equipment wise and everything else? Well, uh, one thing I always say is you don't need to go out and start spending eight, nine hundred dollars for a unit and this and that and the other thing, because first of all, um, an EMF meter is great, but it's not going to be conclusive evidence. So if you've got a decent tape recorder, we actually use, um, because we own, we have a family music store. So I got one of the best digital recorders you can buy, but we actually use reel to reel recorders from the 1960s as well. Oh, wow. They're still, a, they're still the greatest medium for audio ever, ex you know, created by man. And um, so I tell them, just you go out, get a recorder. Your phone's got one, but you know, get a recorder that you can uh, handheld, nice. Uh, get a get a video camera or any camera, you know, um, cheap digital cameras um, will will pick up orbs because they pick up the first thing that moves and amplifies it. You know, magnify it, and that's what it focuses on. So get a either an SLR or a 35 millimeter, anything like that, uh, and you know you can get a few items. You don't have to go break the bank because you are the most important piece of equipment. It's you. You you're nice to them. You interact nice. Your your aura, Matt, you know, is nice and wide and energy and everything. And there's something there. It's gonna say. So you're gonna treat them like, hey, this is a big get together, and we're all just part of it. And that's how we always approach it, my wife and I. And she uses tarot cards, too. And we use dowsing rods and we use pendulums and we use, you know, REM pods and all the latest and greatest spirit boxes and that kind of stuff. And uh, so we go from the oldest to the latest all mixed in. And you don't need a ton of stuff. If, if they're going to speak to you, you're going to get it. If they don't want to hear it from you, you could have, you know, a room full of half a million dollars of equipment and it's going to go nowhere. <laughs> so you are the best thing you've got. I can't beat that. <laughs> <laughs> but tarot cards, that's interesting. So how does that work? Well, she, she's been reading tarot cards and, and forever. And how, how she does it is I could say, Hey, do you like pizza or this, that, and the other thing? But she starts, she just works off the energy of the room, spreads the cards out, you know, and um, if there are people there, she'll have them pick a card if they feel anything, or or she'll pick one, and then she'll start using it to field questions. And we've had an insane success rate at this. Huh. We've been doing it now. We've been doing it for like over 15, 16 years like that, if not longer, maybe to 2000. Wow, it's almost 20 years. We've been using the tarot card for 20 years, since about 2001, to... um 
field of questions, and we've got some amazing results, EVPs huh. and stuff. That's crazy. I've never, I've never heard of anybody using tarot card for like an investigation like that. That's so interesting. Do you have like any, um, like, do you have like a YouTube channel where you post videos and stuff like that, or do you? Well, we did have a spirits meet science one where we did with Gary McKinsey, but we have them on the Dining with the Dead ten thirty one dot com. We have a few on there too. So the tarot um, card would be on that. On the, uh, the if dead. she's using them during an investigation, yeah, we should put one where she is using them. I mean, she's using them all the time, but if something happened during the investigation with the cards, yeah, we definitely have it on there. Because at one point we were doing a place in um the uh, the Bramtail Factory, and Peleg Walker died suddenly. They say you know they, they think maybe he was murdered, but and this was in 1822. Mm -hmm. But then at that point. Uh, only part of became the main factory owner with his father. He suddenly died, and her his wife became the owner of the factory. So she's drawing these cards, and she says, "Who's the woman in charge of finances?" When we listen back later, we get an EVP. It says Aura. His wife's name was Aura Potter. Oh wow! O R R A. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, so that I means we're like we've had this kind of success with it. Where okay, that's a good question because we didn't even know we went. That, that was out of the blue, but yet right. there it was. Huh? You know, it was a lot better than do you like pizza? <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I mean, did you ever get your answer about pizza? Did they hate it? Did they like it? <laughs> nah, nobody. I, didn't, I guess ghosts don't really care for pizza. <laughs> Well, I mean, I guess they, they all depend on the spirit, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another interesting thing real quick, Tom, and you don't really hear these either mentioned too much more anymore, you know, just because of um, they're a great source to find in water, which is the dowsing rods. You don't really hear too much of that anymore. So I guess for somebody like me even who's curious about possibly using dowsing rod. Like, what would you, um, what would you suggest of like how, uh, how I could like get used to a dowsing rod to know what is water or what you, you know? And now, yeah, the dowsing rods actually just work, work off energy basically, and of course, the dowsers, uh, the better that you get at it, it's like anything. Some people could really feel it, you know, the tingly. Uh, what the best way to do it is to just sit there and practice holding them. To get, keep them steady first. And then uh, you program them. Show me yes. And yes could, some people like yes being out. And some people like yes being in. And then the opposite. And show me no. Show me right. Show me left. So once you program them, then you can ask, you know, the yes or no questions. And things like that. And um, and they should work somewhat. My wife does really great dowsing. She's really, one time we were doing um, a she was joking around. She'd go, watch this. It can even tell you direction. Show me north. And the thing kept going this way. And I got the compass. I'm going, the compass, compass in my hand. And I'm going, uh, that's going west on you. That's going west. And she goes, show me north. Well, she wasn't very specific because this guy raises his hand. He goes, my name is uh, James North. <laughs> and it kept pointing right towards him. <laughs> oh, wow. So she should have said, show me the compass point north. <laughs> So I guess wow. you're also going to be a little very specific <laughs> as well. Now, well, now when you're saying to get used to holding them, like should I kind of like gently be holding them, or should I really be holding them? If you have the ones with the sleeves, you can you know hold them. I don't crush them, but I just hold them uh, nicely. But if they don't have the sleeves and just rods, yeah, they should be able. To, you should be able to swing them in your hand like this before steadying them. And then, you know, not let the ends touch or anything like that. If you rest them, if you rest them on uh, the edges on your fingers, that may interrupt everything, the, you know, the angle, uh, the, which is why the sleeve, the ones with sleeves are really nice. They actually make sets now that fold into like, looks like a pen. You open them up and put them out like an antenna. Oh, wow. I have and, not seen that. Yeah, they're easy to, they, you can get them anywhere. And uh, they're great, but, you know, if you put in your kit because they don't take up a lot of room once they're folded and they don't huh. work any different than the others. 
So I guess then, so how would I know it's, um, if, if it's a spirit versus, you know, like, uh, water or something. So how would I really know that, like, is there a certain way to know? If you're looking for water, you would probably be facing downward with them. And then uh, these houses were really good. They, they, they feel the vibration. They see the, the, like the sticks, they twitch. And they twitch because it's them actually too. Because we're, we are attracted to water because we're like, you know what? I forgot how much percentage, like 80% water or something. Yeah, something like that. Water. And so obviously we'd be attracted to water ourselves. And so would a, a wooden stick or something. And most dolls have used wood for that because of that reason. It's like uh, the, the weather sticks, you know, your, your Vermont weather sticks. <laughs> I got two of them. I got one hanging in the front yard and one hanging in the back. <laughs> Perfect. When it's good, they go down when it rains. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, I guess real quick is like uh, you were mentioning getting the dowsing rod. So, you know, sometimes people feel like, uh, you know, sometimes they don't want to run out and buy it. So, I guess their next method would be like clothes hanger. Would you, would you say that works as good like clothes hangers? Yeah, they do actually. They, yeah. Anything works like that. As long as you make it so it's free straight and you know, you, you, and you can actually steady them and they won't move. If, if you, and I've, we've actually made them out of clothes hangers too and used uh, with great results. And I have a few friends. In fact, uh, my buddy Carl Johnson, who was used to be on the Ghost Hunter show, he makes them out of clothes hangers, nice long ones. And, he, you know, he curls up the ends and everything. And he's had some good, really good results with them. Perfect. Yeah, because I, I think I, a long time ago, we tried using clothes hangers for one of our investigations. And, um, <laughs> I forget it's how if we really got anything with them or we just felt we weren't uh, using them properly. But yeah, we we were using clothes hangers. Yeah. yeah, I put it in a vice, you know, about handle length, and then I tap it down so the vice makes a perfect ninety degree angle there. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I want to say we did something similar with that. We used like the the hook part to try to use that as the um, the hole. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, I guess, Tom, so before we, uh, you know, once again, thank you for your time, Tom. Um, yeah, thank you. I, and, awesome. and, and, um, you know, I was hoping, like I was mentioning to you off the air. So, uh, once again, I'll bring up the whole vampire thing. Um, I was really hoping I would have that book that I, you know, think I ordered from you, uh, the history of, uh, the history of England, or. Uh, the vampires in New England, yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, um, hopefully we can get that squared away. But if not, then we'll figure it out. But uh, anyway, maybe what we can do, maybe around the end of September, beginning of October, we can come back together and talk uh, vampires in Vermont. That would be yeah, fun. That'd be cool. That'd be awesome. But uh, for people that would want to, you know get in contact with you, see what you are up to and stuff. Where can people, uh, you know, go to? I know you have quite a few websites, which you mentioned one of, like, a few yeah. times. <laughs> so we have www.tomdagostino.com. That's just my name. And then there's www.diningwiththedead1031.com. That shows all the events. We're doing the ghost hunt events also. And uh, 1031 being Halloween. And, uh, <laughs> and those two are the ones where we, you know, you can look on, see what's going on, what we're up to. Uh, you can contact us. We always tell people if you have any of our books and you go somewhere and something happens, please email us. Let us know. We'd love to hear it. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, that's how I reached out to you anyway, which is through your website. So um, um, I just didn't know what I should pick because you had a, you had the required thing for like, was it a presentation? Was it this or that? So I think I just clicked on like presentation because I just felt like that's, that seemed that's more good logical. enough for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, Tom. Well, thanks again for your time. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll touch base sometime in September or October to see what, uh, availability we both have but it was a uh, pleasure to meet you yeah you too thanks awesome
Yes, and for everybody else listening, think so much, and like Tom said, you know, if you visit a location and something happens, reach out to us and share your stories. Definitely.